Hi, this is J.P. Salibi, and I'm going to be giving the next lecture on digital minimalism, how to save yourself from the technology time thieves. Ever since my cellular phone became smart, I had a burning sensation in my stomach and in my heart that this may not be a great thing. And then when sort of texting took over years ago, I wondered, well, why, why text somebody when you can call them? And I just became a little dismayed at the direction we as humans are going with regard to our electronic devices. So this prompted me after reading a great book, which I will discuss in this lecture, um, to put together a presentation to maybe warn people if it's not totally obvious to them what can happen. I remember growing up as a kid, uh, my parents and my uncles would kind of give me a hard time if I spent too much time in front of a television. Uh, one of my uncles actually called it an idiot box. Um, I now get it. Much like the generation before us had difficulties with maybe our attention to the television or the jukebox or the um, collection of records we had. Remember those records that you'd spin on a machine? Um, and the music we listen to. Um, today, that has shifted to our generation being concerned about our usage and that of our children and grandchildren. This has to do with the attention economy, and it is an economy, and it is manipulated uh, by those with an agenda. And you have to realize that this is not just kind of a free will thing. We are, we are heavily manipulated in using our electronic devices. It stems from the dot-com industry and the dot-com technology uh, with a variety of time thieves. Um, they have much to gain financially from this, as we'll see. Uh, the iPhone or smartphone texting uh, is an extension of you now. I mean, you don't seem to be free of this um, as we progress through life. We're, we're sort of attached all the time with our smart watches and our smartphones. And then you have things like social media, Instagram, Facebook, and the like, which occupies a lot of our time. And of course, email. In my practice, I was inundated with email to the point where I had to develop an email and texting policy so that I could actually get some work done. Otherwise, I would be drowning in responding to emails that are constantly coming in. And then uh, those that Google or use Bing or other search engines to search for things, it's great to do research on the internet, but it does uh, pose a problem that you can slip down uh, the slippery slope of starting to look at one thing and then it leads you down the path to tangents, to looking at other things. Uh, and then, you know, you look at your watch and geez, you've already spent four hours on uh, Google uh, going from one topic to the other. The other thing is consumerism. And we see that with uh, sites like eBay and, and those. Uh, even Amazon might be considered one where folks can spend a lot of time and, and be totally sort of addicted to uh, making purchases online. And then finally, much like television, we have things like Netflix, HBO, Hulu, um, and all these other um, services that are provided. This is easily uh, programmed in your smart television now. And boy, they can really be a major time suck. And, and you can sit down for hours. I'm guilty of this myself. Uh, you know, when I'm bored, I'll sit down and oh, four hours later, I've just binged watched, you know, five episodes of Breaking Bad or something. So you got to be careful and control that behavior or, or it can consume you. I'm going to uh, quote a little bit here from a fellow Aitken Tank. Um, Aitken is the founder of Jotform, uh, which is a dot-com company that actually um, allows for fillable forms online. We actually use a form of this for our intake form. But, uh, you know, he, he wrote this article uh, about how he was feeling guilty about his technological habits and uh, that Americans on average spend, you know, a bunch of times uh, checking their smartphones. For instance, some studies say 52 and other studies I've seen have quoted up to 85 times a day uh, that consumers, and yet we are consumers, will uh, check their smartphones. Uh, nearly 10.5 hours of media time during waking hours. That's a lot of time devoted to this kind of technology. 
And it also basically uh, shortens our attention span. We want immediate gratification. Uh, we want things now um, and immediately. And it kind of builds this bad habit. So this all uh, becomes part of um, uh, this generation. And we have to really recognize it and uh, put limits on it and regulate it ourselves. There is a growing concern about Internet hijacking of our minds. And for good reason. I became concerned with this in the early days of uh, where these devices were coming to the market. And uh, now we have a former Google production manager named Tristan Harris, who in an interview with Wired magazine talked about technology. Technology steers what 2 billion people are thinking and believing every day. So there is this kind of control over um, the media, the digital devices that we have, the internet, in changing our behavior. And uh, it, in recent years, I guess since uh, some issues in 2016 with elections and social media, uh, one can think that there is some manipulation. Uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and some of the social unrest that followed um, a misfortunate killing of a black man in Minnesota. All can be related to how the media is manipulating us through our digital devices. And it's a little bit disheartening to think that the internet is hacking our minds. And it is a bit discouraging. And we are reading more and more about this in articles um, in print. Sometimes we need to declutter um, to better focus. And, and just like your house can be cluttered up, like you have folks that are hoarders and you just can't even move through the house because there's so much junk in all the rooms. Once you've been able to declutter, remove some of that garbage and junk from their homes, you can you know, comfortably pass through the hallways and actually enjoy being in somebody's home. So the benefit of focus and the possibilities that it brings, for example, when we actively choose to declutter our thoughts, much as when we trim the excess of our homes and lives. We often experience great creativity, productivity, self-awareness, and insight. So this talk will talk a little bit about reclaiming our brain, our lives. In our information or attention economy, we're both overtly and subconsciously in, encouraged to devour as much content as possible. We often hear that knowledge is power, so we feed on this never-ending online buffet of information. If we do choose to disconnect, oh my God, or OMG, F-O-M-O. -O. That's a little thing that millennials use now these days. F-O-M-O -O means fear of missing out. And that kind of sets in, and who wants to be sort of the one that didn't get the last memo? One of the first exercises you can do to kind of reclaim your brain and uh, push away time thieves is to be selective. Uh, do this when you're Googling, all right? So um, uh, there's a difference between intentionally pursuing knowledge and mindlessly online snacking. To quote uh, a writer named Rayo, who writes in his book, An Audience of One. Uh, excessive consumption and inflow inhibit creativity, negatively impact our ability to deep work and reduce our cumulative output. So a personal experience here. Um, I'm a big history buff and uh, my forte is uh, American Civil War history and medical advancements. So one day I was researching on a talk I was preparing to give uh, and I started Googling and searching for the number of dead that occurred on both sides during the American Civil War. And that actually led me to another article on the Tipping Rebellion that was uh, essentially going on around the same time as the American Civil War. And this was a civil war in China and from there, it kind of led me down the path to Hung Jiang Quan, and uh, he was one of the leaders of that rebellion um, that started in China. And upon his death, 
how his he was cremated and his ashes were actually blasted out of a cannon in a form of disrespect for him uh, by the controlling powers in China. But I mean, I started with one search and then wound up down this rabbit hole looking at stuff I really had no intention of uh, reading about at that time, and and that that you know stole some hours from me. In his interview with Wired, um, Aitken Tank actually talks about tuning out life's distractions. Uh, he believes in consistent, creative output. It's his responsibility to keep raising the bar for the 5.1 million users and his 150 employees. He's a very disciplined fellow, and over the past 13 years, he's learned some techniques on how to tune out life's myriad distractions, sort of to channel a voice and vision. His lessons to other entrepreneurs or business owners is uh, to achieve a sustained focus um, and it starts with really mental decluttering. To get started you have to um, start by exploring your thoughts and you have to be a little bit disciplined and follow some set rules. Um, there was an author who per published a book on, on this matter. Her name is Julia Cameron and she expressed some ideas, maybe a little bit different than mine, but I'll start with her ideas and then I'll share what I do. So when you arrive at the office each morning, sit down at your computer, but do not check your email or surf the internet. You open up a blank document, let's say open up Word document, and then you write at least uh, three nonstop stream of consciousness pages, or even one page is fine. The process inevitably begins with some random and banal thoughts or observations, but eventually new ideas start to tumble out. So what you want to do is end each session by turning the useful parts of what you've just penned or written into a team email or a plan to implement your ideas. So Julia calls these her morning pages and uh, to her they've become a non-negotiable part of her day. Essentially a mind clearing tool that she uses and recommends for everyone. Now, I don't do it that formally, and I certainly don't sit down and pen out a three-page uh, flow of ideas. But what I do do is I start my day off with a list. And I usually handwrite this because I don't even want to touch my computer that early in the morning. But sometimes when I'm drinking my cup of joe and trying to relax and set my mind and wake my mind up, I'll make a list of things that I need to do today and some thoughts. And um, that's how I start it. Again, not touching my smartphone or my computer or any digital device. Hey, let's for a moment not forget our in-between moments. That's kind of the time where we used to daydream or just sit there and meditate. Um, we, we don't do that much anymore. Uh, when was the last time that you can remember when you were waiting online somewhere at the post office or the grocery store where you didn't glance down at your phone? or check your email, or take a look on Facebook? When was the last time that you can remember driving a distance without having to listen to the music on the radio? Or just, you know, just listen to traffic? According to Dr. Mann, a psychology lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire, letting your mind wander freely actually engages the subconsciousness which activates new neural pathways. In an interview with CBC Radio, Dr. Mann said that boredom gets the creative juices flowing. And it seems today in our day and age that we tend to be getting rid of our moments of quiet and boredom. And he further says, and when we try to get rid of all our boredom, we're perhaps eliminating our creativity as well. And you don't have to listen to music all day long, forever seeing people walk in the streets with their earbuds in, listening to their music. Take your earbuds out, give your ears a rest, 
running a TV all day long, even when you're not in the room, is not necessary. Too much background noise is a huge, big distraction. Go and get unplugged. Kind of like the old MTV Unplugged, where they used acoustic instruments. If you remember those days, that was refreshing when they did that. It was very popular back then. Conversations, that's talking between two people face to face, can also provide a mental jumpstart. In his book, The Geography of Genius, Eric Werner describes Vienna's 1900s era coffee houses as idea factories where discussions flo flowed freely, artists found inspiration, even social mo movements took root. Talking about ideas is often more productive than consuming them because you're both absorbing different perspective and contributing your own. So instead of being spoon fed ideas, that is so much the way of the internet and social media, you're actually having to think for your ideas. A good discussion can clear out the creative cobwebs and set you on a more intentional path. Remember our history in the uh, early years of the American colonies in the mid 1700s. It was conversations and exchanging of ideas in pubs and coffee houses that led to our founding fathers to spawn a revolution. Sometimes we have to apply constraints. We often think that creativity requires a wide open field, no rules, no boundaries. But constraints typically encourage more divergent, innovative thinking. For example, instead of holding a blue sky brainstorming session that fills a whiteboard with assorted suggestions, try narrowing the scope. Or if you're trying to solve a specific problem, limit your content consumption to articles, podcasts, and even films that explore the same topic. Automate and systemize. Establishing robust systems isn't an exciting task, but automating repetitive processes in both your life and your work will free up valuable time you can use to think and create. To give yourself some time back, other things can be done besides just limiting your devices, your electronic devices. You can write standard email responses that can be cut and paste in. You can set up a weekly grocery delivery so you don't have to spend the time going out and shop. And this has become very popular with the COVID shutdown. And you can eliminate as much of the hands-on busy work as possible. You just have to kind of set your priorities for this. Going through and prioritization and, you know, determining what you need to do and what you can push off on others or just eliminate completely from your life and to automate and standardize, you'll gain some time back. At some point when you realize how much time you're wasting with your digital devices, it's time to change your state, to change your state of mind and your state of being. Despite our best intentions, We've all fallen into that zombie-like state of mindless web surfing or Instagram scrolling at one time or another, where none of us are immune from that. That's when it's time to change course. Once you've realized what kind of a quandary you're in, it's time to change course. Go for a walk, get up and get yourself a cup of coffee or tea, even take a nap. It's possible you may need a nap to reset your thoughts and break unhelpful uh, patterns. Talk to a colleague. There's no need to feel guilty, but it's incredibly how quickly the brain gets to work when you give it some much needed breathing space. A good example is Microsoft, big company, forward thinkers. Microsoft gave their employees a four day work week versus the usual five days, and productivity increased by 40%. In my private practice, I insist on a good life-work balance, and we work four days a week, 
Monday through Thursday, we have Fridays off. And I always encourage and often scold my staff if they take work home with them. Everything should be put to rest and tidied up and shut down at 5 p.m. when they leave. There's no need to be checking emails at 8 o'clock at night. Sometimes it does the mind and the body good to do nothing. To sit at the end of a dock and look out over a lake or an ocean and just let your mind wander and, you know, yeah, get caught up in some daydreaming. Sometimes that it's like hitting the reset button on your body and on your mind. So for quite a number of years, I've always had my reservations about getting bogged down in sort of the digital emails and texting and all that social media stuff. Um, and it wasn't really until uh, about a year or two ago when I picked up a copy of Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World, that I sort of got my thoughts together on doing a presentation. In Cal's book, he talks about a process. You have to follow a sort of a process to get out from underneath the clutches of time thieves and, and digital addiction. Uh, you have to adopt a philosophy of digital declutter. So this is a great book for someone who wants to take this process seriously. A 30-day digital detox is one way to go, but some people can't go cold turkey and you have to um, join a, a group of people called the attention resistance, if you will, to kind of fight the addiction of digital um, system, the system we live in. A weekend retreat may be the answer for getting a kickstart on becoming a digital minimalist. So let's dive in a little deeper now on the uh, the this organization of social media and internet information. It's a little bit of a lopsided arms race. For those that may not know, Facebook was initially um, created and named the Facebook. And so my question is, how did the Facebook.com become Facebook the monster? Steve Jobs is one of Silicon Valley's wonder kids and visionaries. And how did Steve Jobs not know or realize when Apple launched the iPhone what it would become? He did not even envision anything other than an integration of his iPod device, which housed all the music, into a cell phone. He didn't think beyond that when it came out. And another thing, how did the lowly search engine Google become a behemoth tech giant with special interest groups and lobbyists on Capitol Hill? I mean, this, this thing is monmouth. It's huge and it's a little bit scary. Now, I'm not a big Bill Maher fan, but he did say something, and I'm going to quote him here, that was really interesting, and he hit the nail on the head. He quote, The tycoons of social media have to admit they're just the tobacco farmers in t-shirts selling an addictive product to children. Let's face it, checking your likes is like the new smoking. And don't think for one minute this is not planned or manipulated. Programmers in Silicon Valley are intentionally programming apps to keep you hooked like a gambler in a casino on a slot machine. And there have been whistleblowers within the tech industry that have come forward and said that's what's happening there. And some have had issues with their consciences and have decided to leave the industry. So getting started as a digital minimalist, um, the first thing you want to attack really is email. Um, is anyone here burdened with checking and responding to emails? I don't know about anyone in the audience, but I sure was. And I'll tell and share a personal story that it started to happen about two years ago in my private practice, managing two offices and having been inundated with emails from staff, nurses, practitioners, all emailing me different times in a day. I felt like I was married to my computer and it, it took me two hours at the end of the day just to get my inbox emptied out. 
Didn't like that at all. So I implemented a policy. It was basically a texting, phone, and email policy that limited the amount of emails that my staff could send me, especially if they weren't emergent. Uh, and it would be done in a sort of what we call end of day email. So anything that was not emergent or critically important could be placed in a single email that would be sent out and organized in a fashion that would be easy to answer and reply to and solve the issue. Part of the solution for an email burden problem is start to unsubscribe. So set an unsubscribe campaign. All the spam you get, either send it to the spam folder or unsubscribe to the stuff coming in. It's not necessary and it'll lighten your load. And also make an effort to only check your emails a few times during the day. Schedule it. Like maybe say, you know, I'm going to check my email from 9 to 9.30 in the morning when I get to work. And then again at 4. And if you stick with that schedule, it'll lighten your load. For necessary emails, set up an email policy, like I just mentioned, and have everyone at home and at work adhere to it. And you will experience some newfound freedom and free time by just tackling the email problem. Another thing you can do is take on the task of digital decluttering. Remove non-essential apps from your smartphone. I encountered a problem with my wife's phone. I was looking for an app and there were so many apps on her windows. I had to scroll through several windows to get to the app. I was like, oh my God, that's, that's just too much. Plus it, eat, it eats up your battery and all kinds of issues. Uh, use your, your computer to access things like Facebook and other apps that you deem necessary and convenient at your work or in your personal life, but get them off your phone. Check them on a schedule. Don't just knee-jerk reach for your phone when you're bored or your computer when you have a free minute to check things. Be a little bit more disciplined. Consider changing from a smartphone to a what we call light phone or light phone 2, which is a credit card size device. It's a little bit lighter and it's only used for texting, phone calls, and alarms. And um, it, it doesn't have all the other heavy uh, digital things like your uh, surfing the net, the internet, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a smaller, lighter form of a cell phone that'll still keep you connected to other people, but won't burden you down. Finally, it'll be good for you to spend a little time alone. Allow yourself to daydream. Meditation or even a nap will help. Allow yourself to doodle. Yeah, scribble on a little piece of paper. That can be a little bit of a distraction you may need. This has actually been shown to increase productivity and I'll reference that in a minute. Start with about 10 minutes per day and work your way up a little bit. Work towards a long weekend uh, free from electronics and technical devices. When I had my kids over on the weekends, I would have an electronic free weekend. That means no cell phone, no computer, no TV. And we would kind of push the issue about going outside in nature and taking long hikes. Yeah, they grumbled about it in the beginning, but you know, after a fashion, they really enjoyed it and they would get back to the house after a, a few hours hiking in the woods or playing Frisbee or going to a museum, something non-digital that it was actually refreshing for them. So Dr. Serena Pillay is a neuroscientist and he wrote a book called Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. And he talks about harnessing your mind's innate tendency to kind of wander, stall, rest, and unfocus. And in the, in the meantime, you're actually becoming more productive. On this slide, I'm gonna say, don't click like. But first, let's look at some no notable social media demographics. And some of these may surprise you as they did me when I first came across them. With regard to Twitter, about 80% of users access Twitter via mobile. Very few use the computer, uh, tabletop computer or laptop. With Facebook, 
the largest percentage of users are 65 years and older. Instagram, the majority of all internet users are aged 18 to 29, use this form of social media. And Snapchat, female users comprise 70% of Snapchat users. So don't click like and don't follow folks on social media. You don't have to live your life precariously through the lives of others, especially the Kardashians. Don't use them as folks you want to follow and adhere to what they do. And don't reach for social media apps. They're very distracting in daily life. And you don't need to comment on every single post in social media. That's a bad habit to get into. So be very, very selective in what you do. Prioritize what you want to do, what's really, really important, and then get rid of the rest of the stuff. Make sure it is important and adds value to your life. So we also need to reclaim our leisure. Leisure without the iPhone. Avoid distractions. Don't miss out on life. Eat your food. Don't get caught up in taking pictures of your food for Yelp. And do people really care where you're eating breakfast on Saturday mornings? This picture that's in this slide, it was very funny, kind of rang, resonated with me. And it was um, September 8th uh, of last year where uh, there was a, a bad storm and uh, in Georgia or around the uh, Golden Isles or the Georgia coast, there was a container ship that was transporting cars that got caught up in a bad, nasty wave and actually tipped over. So here you have a photograph that actually made the front page of the Jekyll Island News at showing this tipped over cargo vessel and two sunbathers, these are, this was during maybe a spring break or something, uh, beach goers, these two young women are out on the beach and they should be like taken in nature or at the very least this very bizarre image of a big vessel on its side. But no, they're not. They're actually probably texting their friends at the sorority or something. This presentation should be a call to action. Join the attention resistance. Because attention thieves can affect performance, drain your brain of energy, cause fatigue, and cause insomnia, affect your relationship with your family and friends, boyfriends and girlfriends, and spouses, can be very distracting and cause decrease in performance and creativity at work, cause desocialization, and increase rates of mental illness. It's been shown that, especially with children, young children who are greatly involved and addicted to their devices, it can disrupt their sleep, can cause fatigue, mental fatigue, and mental illness such as depression and suicide. We've noticed an uptick in suicides in younger people, and there seems to be a link with the use of their technical digital devices. Binge watching Netflix. Has anyone ever done that? I mean, I'm guilty of that too. And during the COVID lockdown, I'm sure more Americans binge watch TV more than any time in their lives. There was just nothing else to do. But if you're going to do some TV watching, make sure it's something educational, at least some history or science programs, not watching the Kardashians. 60% of Americans polled binge watched at least once a week. 28% state that they do it at least twice a week, 15% report binge watching daily, and this does affect productivity, and it's a major time suck. I'm sure there's more than one person in this room who's binge watched the um, Game of Thrones. I mean, I'll be guilty of that. Uh, you can go through a season in one or two days, but it's been shown that in adults aged 50 and older, Watching TV for more than three and a half hours per day is associated with a dose response decline in verbal memory over six years. The more TV you watch, the greater the decline. And um, Daisy Fancourt, 
a researcher is quoted as saying, those who watch television for more than three and a half hours per day experience on average an eight to 10% decline or decrease in verbal memory over the same period. Besides its effect on our brain and our memory and our attitudes and our moods, binge watching TV can have some other physical or organic manifestations. Um, frequently, it's associated with an increase in venous thromboembolic disease. Specifically, people who said they watch TV very often had a 71% greater risk of deep vein thrombosis compared to people who say they never or seldom watch TV. Higher BMI, body mass index, mitigated this link by approximately 25%, but did not explain the entire association. Even among individuals with a high level of physical activity, those who watch TV very often had a increased risk for venous thrombolic disease compared to those who seldom watch TV. Another very physical thing with binge watching is every additional hour per day spent in front of the television is associated with a 12% increase risk of mortality related to inflammatory diseases. This includes lower respiratory, influenza pneumonia, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, diabetes type 2, and kidney disease. The authors of a study that researched this stated, this is consistent with the hypothesis that high TV viewing may be associated with chronic inflammatory disease states. Researchers have also shown that longer time spent watching TV is associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. Specifically, middle-aged adults who watch five or more hours of TV per day had an increased risk of all-cause mortality compared to those who watch less than one hour per day. And um, we see a 19% increase in men and a 32% increase in women with this. With regard to cardiovascular disease, then the rates were a little bit more similar. 20% uh, increase in men and 33% increased risk in women. Another thing that can be of danger is this whole thing of selfies. Selfies can be dangerous. People will do some dangerous stuff to capture it on uh, on their iPhone or their smartphone. And here, here you see a picture of a fellow at some kind of demonstration or riot, and he's like right in front of that fire, and he's, he's in harm's way. He should be kind of more concerned about what's going around him than trying to get in a picture. Here's another fellow. I think this is actually Photoshop, but I couldn't help but put it in the uh, presentation. Here's a dude, and this is totally oblivious to this great white that's about to take his head off. And um, in the bottom right, you see a guy that's in probably one of our national uh, parks who's getting dangerously close to a bear to get a picture of himself with that bear. Again, it forces people to do stupid things and make stupid decisions. And how many times have we seen this? You go out for a meal with friends and family, and it shouldn't be everyone head down staring at their phones. So this, this might be a little bit of an exaggeration uh, some of these pictures, but I, I've seen this. I've seen uh, a mom and dad with the kids, and they're at a pizza parlor, and the kids are on their iPads or their smartphones, and nobody's interacting or talking. They are just barely have enough energy to feed themselves, um, but the whole time they have their head down. And we're, we're starting to see issues with, you know, neck pain and other anatomical problems, joint pains in the thumbs from all the uh, digital surfing that people do and having their heads down in that position. Um, it's just not a good thing and for, for physical reasons and, and for socialization as well. And it's not just the average Joe on the street. 
I mean, celebrities are not immune. I mean, here's a very famous picture of a bunch of celebrities doing a selfie at, I think it's the uh, Oscar Awards uh, a year or two ago. Given our current circumstances over the last three to four months, I had to put this picture in the presentation because I think this whole COVID-19 pandemic uh, has actually changed a number of things in our lives and our work. And this may actually be the new way to surf the internet on your smartphone. So one of my favorite comedians is Sebastian Maniscalco. And in his HBO special, Aren't You Embarrassed? He takes a stab at um, talking on a cell phone and taking pictures of yourself on your phone. And just sit back and, and listen to this. It's funny. Look around you. Everybody's just walking around. <laughs> Taking a photo of yourself? They call it a selfie. I can't even say the word without sweating. I can't stand the word. I call it taking a lonely. Do you know how alone you gotta be? That you can't find anybody to take a photo? That you got 838 photos of yourself in your bathroom? What do you do? What are you doing? And in wrapping up this presentation, I just want to throw this out there for you. I found this on the internet. It's pretty, pretty cool image with a big, strong message. Uh, just don't be among the iPhone walking dead. If anyone out there is interested in a weekend digital free retreat, let me know. I've been uh, working on putting something together with some clinical psychologists and counselors, and it's for folks that may have digital addictions, and it's a good way to maybe kickstart a digital detox for uh, removing oneself from the grasps of these, the attention economy folks and uh, getting your life back. So if you're interested, uh, we may be putting these together at a retreat house for small groups. Uh, email me at dr.salibi at carolinaholisticmedicine.com and in the subject heading just put weekend digital retreat and I'll get back to you.